Chapter 16 of the Golden Compass, The Silver Guillotine Lyra ducked her head at once under the shelter of her wolverine hood and shuffled in through the double doors with the other children. Time enough later to, wor time enough later to worry about what she had to say when they came face to face, she had another problem to deal with first, and that was how to hide her furs where she could get at them without asking permission. But luckily... There was such disorder inside with the adults trying to hurry the children through so as to clear the way for the passengers from the Zeppelin that no one was watching very carefully. Lyra slipped out of the, her, the anorak, the leggings, and the boots and bundled them up as small as she could before shoving through the crowded corridors in her dormitory. Quickly, she dragged a locker to the corner, stood on it, and pushed at the ceiling. The panel lifted, just as Roger had said, and into the space beyond, she thrust the boots and leggings. As an afterthought, she took the alphamometer from her pouch and hid it in the inmost pocket of the anorak before shoving that through, too. She jumped down, pushed back the locker, and whispered to Pantalaemon, We must just pretend to be stupid till she sees us, and then say we were kidnapped, and nothing about the Egyptians of Uruk, especially. Because Lyra now realized if she hadn't done so before, that all the fear in her nature was drawn to Mrs. Coulter, Mrs. Coulter as a compass needle is drawn to the pole. All the other things she'd seen and even the hideous cruelty of the intercision she could cope with. She was strong enough, but that thought of that sweet face and gentle voice, the image of that golden playful monkey was enough to melt her stomach and make her pale and nauseated. But the Egyptians were coming. Think of that. Think of Yurik. And don't give yourself away, she said, and drifted back towards the canteen from where a lot of noise was coming. Children were lining up to get hot drinks, some of them still in their coal silk anoraks. Their talk was all of the Zeppelin and his passenger. It was her, with the monkey demon. Did she get you too? She said, she said she'd write to my mom and dad, and I bet she never. She never told us about kids getting killed. She never said nothing about that. That monkey... He's the worst. He caught my carassa and nearly killed her. I could feel all weak. They were all frightened as Lyra was. She found Annie and the others and sat down. Listen, she said. Can you keep a secret? Yeah. The three faces turned to her, vivid with expectation. There's a plan to escape, Lyra said quietly. There's some people coming to take us away, Right? And they'll be here in about a day, maybe sooner. What we all got to do is be ready as soon as the signal goes and get our cold weather clothes at once and run out. No waiting about. You just got to run. Only if you don't get your anoraks and boots and stuff. You'll die of cold. What signal, Annie demanded. The fire bell. Like this afternoon. It's all organized. All the kids are going to know and none of the grown-ups, especially not her. Their eyes were gleaming with hope and excitement. And all through the canteen, the message was being passed around. Lyra could tell that the atmosphere had changed. Outside, the children had been energetic and eager for play. Then when they had seen Mrs. Coulter, Mrs. Coulter, they were bubbling with a suppressed hysterical fear. But now there was a control and purpose of their talking in this. Lyra marveled at the effect of hope, the effect hope could have. So all the kids have something to look forward to. They're going to be rescued. She watched through the open doorway, but carefully ready to duck her head because there were adult voices coming, and then Mrs. Coulter herself was briefly visible, looking in and smiling at the happy children with their hot drinks and their cake, so warm and so well-fed. A little shiver ran almost instantaneously through the whole canteen, and every child was still in silence staring at her. Mrs. Coulter smiled and passed on without a word. Little by little, the talk started again. Lyra said, Where do they go to talk? Probably the conference room, said Annie. They took us there once, she added, meaning her and their demon. There was about 20 grown-ups there, and one of them was giving a lecture, and I had to stand there and do what he told me, like seeing how far my Kyrillian could go away from me, and then he hypnotized me and did some other things. It's a big room with a lot of chairs and a table and a little platform. It's behind the front office. 
Hey, I bet they're going to pretend the fire drill went off all right. I bet they're scared of her, same as we are. For the rest of the day, Lyra stayed close to the other girls, watching, staying, saying little, remaining in, inconspicuous. There was exercise, there was sewing, there was supper, there was playtime in the lounge, a big shabby room with a board games and a few tattered books and a table tennis table. At some point, Lyra and the others became aware that there was some kind of subdued emergency going on because the adults were hurrying to and fro or standing in anxious groups talking urgently. Lyra guessed they discovered the demon's escape and were wondering how it had happened. But she didn't see Mrs. Coulter, which was a relief. When it was time for bed, she knew she had to let the other girls into her confidence. She had to tell them who she was. Listen, she said, do you ever come around and see if we're asleep? Do they ever come around and see if we're asleep? They just look in one, said Bella. They just flash a lantern around. They don't really look. Good, because I'm going to go and look around. There's a way through the ceiling that this boy showed me. She explained, and before she'd even finished, Annie said, I'll come with you. No, you better not, because it'll be easier if there's just one person missing. You can all say you fell asleep and you don't know where I'm gone. But if I came with you, more likely to get caught, said Lyra. Their two demons were standing at e staring at each other, Pantalaemon as a wild cat, Annie's Kyrillian as a fox. They were quivering. Pantalaemon uttered the lowest, softest hiss and bared his teeth, and Kyrillian turned aside and began to groom himself unconcernedly. All right, then, said Annie, resigned. It was, co it was, a qu it was quite common for struggles between children to be settled by their demons in this way, with one accepting the dominance of the other. Their humans accepted the outcome without resentment. On the whole, Celira knew that Annie would do as she asked. So Pantalaemon just kind of like put Kyrillian, Annie's demon, in his place. They all contributed items of clothing to bulk out Lyra's bed and make it look as if she was still there, and swore to say they knew nothing about it. Then Lyra listened at the door to make sure no one was coming, jumped up on the locker, pushed up the panel, and hauled herself through. Just don't say anything, she whispered down to the three faces watching. Then she dropped the panel gently back into place and looked around. She was crouching in a narrow metal channel, supported in a framework of girders and struts. The panels of the ceilings were slightly translucent, so some light came up from below. And in the faint gleam, Lyra could see this narrow space, only two feet or so in height, extending in all directions around her. It was crowded with metal ducts and pipes, and it would be easy to get lost in, but provided she kept to the metal and avoided putting any weight on the panels, and as long as she made no noise, she should be able to go from one end of the station to the other. It's just like back in Jordan, Pan, she whispered, looking in the retiring room. If you hadn't done that, none of this would have happened, he whispered back. Then it's up to me to undo it, isn't it? She got her bearings working out approximately which direction the conference room was in, and then set off. It was a far from easy journey. She had to move on hands and knees because the space was too low to crouch in, and every so often she had to squeeze under a big square duct or lift herself over some heating pipes. The metal channels she crawled in followed the tops of internal walls as far as she could tell, and as long as she stayed in them, she felt a comforting solidity below her. But they were very narrow and had sharp edges, so sharp that she cut her knuckles and her knees on them, and before long, she was sore all over and cramped and dusty. But she knew roughly where she was, and she could see the dark bulk of furs crammed in about above the dormitory to guide her back. She could tell where a room was empty because the panels were dark, and from time to time, she heard voices from below and stopped to listen. But it was only the cooks in the kitchen or the nurses in what Lyra, in her Jordan way, thought as the common room. They were saying nothing interesting, so she moved on. In case you guys are confused, she's up in the ceiling right now. At least she came to the at last she came to the area where the conference room should be, according to her calculations. And sure enough, there was an area free of any pipe work, where conditioning and heating ducts led down to one end, and where all the panels in wide rectangular space were left lit evenly. She placed her ear to the panel and heard a murmur of male adult voices, so she knew she had found the right place. She listened carefully and then inched her way along till she was as close as she could get to the speakers. Then she lay full length in the metal cha channel 
and leaned her head sideways to hear as well as she could. There was the occasional clink of cutlery, cutlery, uh, or the sound of glass on glasses drip. A glass on glass as drink was poured as they were having dinner as they talked. There were four voices, she thought, including Mrs. Coulter's. The other three were men. They seemed to be discussing the escape demons. But who's in charge of supervising that section, said Mrs. Coulter's gentle musical voice. A research student called McKay, said one of the men. But there are automatic mechanisms to prevent this sort of thing happening. They didn't work, she said. With respect, they did, Mrs. Coulter. McKay assures us that he locked all the cages when he left the building at 1,100 hours today. The outer door, of course, would not have been opened in any case because he entered and left by the inner door, so as he normally did. There's a code that has to be entered in the ordinator controlling the locks, and there's a record in its memory of his doing so. Unless that's done, an alarm goes off. But the alarm didn't go off, she said. It did. Unfortunately, it rang when everyone was outside, taking part in the fire drill. But when you went back inside, unfortunately, both alarms are on the same circuit. That's a design fault that will have to be rectified, will have to be fixed. What it meant was that when the fire bell was turned off after the practice, the laboratory alarm was turned off as well. Even then, it would still have been picked up because of the normal checks that would have been taken at place taken place after every disruption of routine. But by that time, Mrs. Coulter, you had arrived unexpectedly, and if you recall, you asked specifically to meet the laboratory staff there and then in your room. Consequently, no one returned to the laboratory until some time later. I see, said Mrs. Coulter coldly. In that case, the demons must have been released during the fire drill itself, and that widens the list of suspects to include every adult in the station. Had you considered that? Had you considered that it might have been done by a child, said someone else. She was silent, and then the second man went on. Every adult had a task to do, and every task would have taken their full attention, and every task was done. There was no possibility that any of the staff could have, done, could have opened the door. None. So either someone came from outside altogether with the intention of doing that, or one of the children managed to find his way there, open the door and the cages, and return to the front of the main building. And what are you doing to investigate, she said. No. On second thought, don't tell me. Please understand, Dr. Cooper. I'm not criticizing out of malice, out of hate. We have to be quite extraordinarily careful. It was an atrocious, atrocious lapse to have allowed both alarms to be on the same circuit. That must be corrected at once. Possibly the Tartar officer in charge of the guard could help you your investigation. I merely mentioned that as a possibility. Where were the Tartars during the fire drill, by the way? I suppose you have considered that? Yes, we have, said the man warily. The guard was fully occupied on patrol, every man. They kept meticulous records, very careful records. I'm sure you're doing your very best, she said. Well, there we are, a great pity. But enough of that for now. Tell me about the new separator. Lyra felt a thrill of fear. There was only one thing this could mean. Ah, said the doctor, relieved to find the conversation turning to another subject. There's a real advance. With the first model, we could never entirely overcome the risk of the patient dying of shock. But we've improved that on... We've, eh, we've improved that no end. The Skraylings did it better by hand, said a man who hadn't spoken yet. Centuries of practice, said the other man. But simply tearing was the only option for some time, said the main speaker. However distressing that was to the adult operators. If you remember, we had to discharge quite a number for reasons of stress-related anxiety. But the first big breakthrough was the use of anesthesia combined with the Maestad and Barrick scallop, scalpel. We were able to reduce death from operative shock to below 5%. And a new instrument, said Mrs. Coulter. The era was trembling. The blood was pounding in her ears, and Pantalaemon was pressing his ermine form against her side and whispering, Hush, Lyra. They won't do it. We won't let them do it. Yes, it was a curious discovery by Lord Azrael himself that gave us the key to the new method. He discovered that an alloy of manganese, manganese and titanium has the property of insulating body from demon. By the way, what is happening with Lord Azrael? Perhaps you haven't heard, said Mrs. Coulter. Lord Azrael is under suspended sentence of death. 
One of the conditions of his exile in Slobbard was that he gave up his philosophical work entirely. Unfortunately, he managed to obtain books and materials, and he's pushed his heretical investigations to the point where it's positively dangerous to let him live. At any rate, it seems that the Vatican Council has begun to debate the question of the sentence of death, and the probability is that it'll be carried out. But your new instrument, Doctor, how does it work? Uh, yes, sentence of death, you say? Gracious God, I'm sorry. The new instrument, we're investigating what happens when the intercision is made with the patient in a conscious state, a wake state. And of course, that couldn't be done with the Maestad process. So we developed a kind of guillotine, something that chops off your head. I suppose you could say, the blade is made of manganese and titanium alloy, and the child is placed in a compartment, like a small cabin of alloy mesh, with the demon in a similar compartment, connect with it. While there is a connection, of course, the link remains. Then the blade is brought down between them, severing the link, cutting the link, and they are separate entities, separate beings. I should like to see it, she said. Soon, I hope, but I'm tired now. I think I'll go to bed. I want to see all the children tomorrow. We shall find out who opened the door. There was a sound of chairs being pushed back, polite expressions, a door closing. Then Lyra heard the others sit down again and go on talking, but more quietly. What is Lord Israel up to? I think he's got an entirely different idea of the nature of dust. That's the point. It's profoundly heretical. You see, and the consistorial court of discipline can't allow any other interpretation than the authorized one. But besides, he wants to experiment. To experiment with dust? Hush! Not so loud. Do you think she'll make an unfavorable report? No, no, I think you dealt with her very well. Her attitude worries me. Not philosophical, you mean? Exactly. A personal interest. I don't like to use the word, but it's almost ghoulish. That's a bit strong. But do you remember the first experiments when she was so keen to see them pulled apart? Lyra couldn't help it. A little cry escaped her, and at the same time, she tensed and shivered, and her foot knocked against a stanchion. What was that? In the ceiling. Quick! The sound of chairs being thrown aside, feet running a table, pulled across the floor. Lyra tried to scramble away, but there was so little space, and before she could move more than a few yards, the ceiling panel beside her was thrust up suddenly, and she was looking into the startled face of a man. She was close enough to see every hair in his mustache. He was as startled as she was, but with more freedom to move, he was able to thrust a hand into the gap and seize her arm. A child! Don't let her go. Lyra sank her feet teeth into his large freckled hand he cried out but didn't let go even when she drew blood pantalaemon was snarling and spitting but it was no good the man was much stronger than she was and he pulled and pulled until her other hand desperately clinging to the stan to the stanchion had to loosen and she half fell through into the room she didn't still she didn't utter a sound she hooked her legs over the sharp edge of the metal above and struggled upside down, scratching, biting, punching, spitting in a passionate fury. The men were gasping and grunting with pain or exertion, but they pulled and pulled. And suddenly, all the strength went out of her. She became weak. It was as if an alien hand had reached right inside where no hand had a right to be and wrenched at something deep and precious. She felt faint, dizzy, sick, disgusted, limp with shock. One of the men was holding Pan to Layman. He had seized Lyra's demon in his human hands, and poor Pan was shaking nearly out of his mind with horror and disgust. His wildcat shape, his fur now dull with weakness, now sparking glints of ambaric alarm. He curved towards his Lyra as she reached with both hands for him. They fell still. They were captured. She felt those hands. It wasn't allowed. Not supposed to touch. Wrong. Was she on her own? A man was peering into the ceiling space. Seems to be on her own. Who is she? The new child? The one... The Samoyed hunters? Yes. You don't suppose she, the demons, could well be. But not on her own, surely. Should we tell? I think that would put the seal on things, don't you? I agree. Better she doesn't hear at all. But what can we do about this? She can't go back with the other children. Impossible. There's only one thing we can do, it seems to me. Now... Have to. Can't leave it till the morning. She wants to watch. We could do it ourselves. No need to involve anyone else. 
The man who seemed to be in charge, the man who wasn't holding either Lyra or Panthalaemon, tapped his teeth with a thumbnail. His eyes were never still. They flickered and slid and darted this way and that. Finally, he nodded. Now, do it now, he said. Otherwise, she'll talk. The shock will prevent that. At least she won't remember who she is, what she saw, and what she heard. Come on. Lyra couldn't speak. She could hardly breathe. She had to let herself be carried through the station, along white empty corridors, past rooms humming with ambaric power, past the dormitories where children slept with their demons on their pillow besides them, sharing their dreams in every second of the way. She watched Pantalaemon, and he reached for her, and their eyes never left each other. Then a door which opened by the means of a large wheel, a hiss of air, and a brilliantly lit chamber with dazzling white tiles and stainless steel. The fear she felt was almost a physical pain. It was a physical pain as they pulled her and Pantalaemon over towards a large cage of pale silver mesh, above which a great pale silver blade hung poised to separate them forever and ever. She found a voice at last and screamed, the sound echoed loudly off the shiny surfaces, but the heavy door had hissed shut. She could scream and scream forever, and not a sound would escape. But Pantalaemon and Answer had twisted free of those hateful hands. He was a lion, an eagle. He tore at them with vicious talons. Great wings beat wildly. And then he was a wolf, a bear, a polecat, darting, snarling, slashing a succession of transformations, too quick to register, and all the time leaping, flying, dodging from one spot to another as their clumsy hands flail and snatch at the empty air. But they had demons too, of course. It wasn't two against three, it was two against six. A badger, an owl, and a baboon were all just as intent to pin Pantalaemon down, and Lyra was crying after them. Why? Why are you doing this? Help us. You shouldn't be helping them. And she kicked and bit more passionately than ever, until the man holding her gasped and let go for a moment, and she was free, and Pantalaemon sprang towards her like a spark of lightning. And she clutched him to her fierce breast, and he dug his wildcat claws into her flesh, and every stab of pain was dear to her. Never, 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 she cried, and backed against the wall to defend him to their death. But they fell on her again, three big brutal men, and she was only a child, shocked and terrified, and they were pant and they tore Pantalaemon away and threw her into one side of the cage of mesh and carried him, struggling still around to the other. There was a mesh barrier between them, but he was still part of her. They were still joined. For a second or so more, he was still her own dear soul. Above the panting on the men, Above her own sobs, above the high, wild howl of her demon, Lyra heard a humming sound and saw one man, bleeding from the nose, operate a bank of switches. The other two looked up, and her eyes followed theirs. The great, pale silver blade was rising slowly, catching the brilliant light. The last moment in her complete life was going to be the worst by far. What is going on here? A light musical voice, her voice, everything stopped. What are you doing, and who is this child? She didn't complete the word child, because in that instant she recognized Lyra. Through tear-blurred eyes, Lyra saw her totter and clutch at a bench, her face so beautiful and composed. It grew in a moment, haggard and horror-struck. Remember, everybody, Mrs. Coulter is Lyra's mom. Lyra, she whispered. The golden monkey darted from her side in a flash and tugged Pantalaemon out from the mesh cage. As Lyra fell out herself, Pantalaemon pulled free of the monkey's salacious paws and stumbled to Lyra's arms. Never, never, she breathed into his fur, and he pressed his beating heart to hers. They clung together like survivors of a shipwreck, shivering on a desolate coast, on an empty coast. Dimly, she heard Mrs. Coulter speaking to the men, but she couldn't even interpret her tone of voice. And then they were leaving in that hateful room, and Mrs. Coulter was half carrying, half supporting her along a corridor, and then there was a door, a bedroom, scent in the air. Soft light. Mrs. Coulter laid her gently on the bed. Lyra's arms was so tight around Pantalaemon that she was trembling with the force of it. A tender hand stroked her head. My dear, dear child, said the sweet voice, however did you come to be here? All right, so that was a pretty exciting scene. Lyra and Pantalaemon were almost separated by that silver guillotine. We'll talk about that in class. It's interesting to note how Mrs. Coulter, obviously the villain in this story, is being very tender and kind to her daughter, Lyra. And Lyra does not enjoy her company, but obviously she was just saved by her. 
So we'll discuss in class what that all means or might mean.